Would you turn to Colossians and we'll be consistent. So we'll go through Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. We'll be consistent. We'll take it one verse at a time, if just up to this point in time. So Colossians 1 and verse 14. <clears throat> and the word of God reads, <clears throat> In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, Christianity of all religions in the world ought to be the most thankful religion. Our brothers, be of good cheer. We are of all men ought to be the most grateful. We are ever meant to be a joyful group of people. No matter the circumstances we're in. No matter trials we go through. We are ever meant to be well pleased. We of all people in this world. Ought to walk around with a, with a smile in our hearts. For example, in 1 Peter, this epistle that was written to Christians that were under such a heavy persecution during the harshest and the darkest time of their lives. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8, Peter says to this group of Christians, In him you greatly rejoice, with joy inexpressible and full of glory. In other words, this group of Christians, though they were going through hard time, their, the intensity of their joy was so great that when Peter came to describe how they felt at that time and began to pen it down, all he could find to articulate the intensity of their joy he would say, inexpressible and full of glory. And more than that, brothers, is there any other darker time than when our Lord Jesus Christ endured the cross? But yet, what does the author of Hebrews say about our Lord? In Hebrews 12, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Even in his darkest time of all history, there was joy that remained. How do we do this? How? How do we stand firm in our joy, though the, the strong current of this world is trying to drag our feet into misery. How do we do this? We've been answering this question in the past several weeks. And to really sum it up in a nutshell, we said that grateful people are joyful people. Or to put it another way, fertilizing the soil of our lives with Thankfulness makes the flower of joy blossom and it flourishes. How are we meant to be thankful? Well, first and foremost, our eternal spiritual blessings that God graced us with. We need to meditate on these blessings. So, so far in verse 12, we have gone and uh, in depth and we understood that we ought to be thankful to our infinitely loving Father who qualifies the most unqualified sinners. He spoils us with such inheritance that is out of this world, literally speaking. And in verse 13, we've had, we found that we ought to be thankful to Him for rescuing us from that dark, deceptive dungeon of Satan. How Christ conquered death and its captain for us. He crushed the devil's powerful grip that held us captive to do his will. 
And then the Father transferred us to his most loving and beloved King, who now rules in our heart forever. How can we but be ever so thankful to God for such juicy, delicious, and sweet blessings that he bestowed upon us? Brothers, if we are to examine every spiritual blessing that we are blessed with, we would discover indeed that we are spoiled children of God. And had it not been that God's promises to us are healthy to our souls, we would have been among all men developed spiritual diabetes from how sweet God's promises are to us. Right? And not only are they sweet, but there are too many. There are far more than can be numbered. Dear beloved, we need to understand this. Be of good cheer. Our God is not stingy. He's not. He doesn't clench his fist when he gives us his blessings. No. He digs his hand into his divine bag, as it were. And then he goes so deep into it and grabs all there is and then gives us sparingly. And then he would bring that bag and pours it upside down upon our heads. And what we need to do today is to continue to lift up our eyes to him who loves us with such a great love. And we need to continue to ponder and reflect on God's benefits for us. And as we do that, we need to keep this one simple and single application in mind. To be consistent with Paul's desire. In his prayer. And that is that we would be thankful to God. That we would give thanks to the Father for all his blessings that he blessed us with. Well, what are other benefits that we have for us today that the Lord wants us to meditate on? Well, in verse 14, again, the text says, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins and can I say this is not just one blessing at least we can find here three blessings three benefits and that will um, be the outline for today's message three the first in whom that is our union with Christ second we have redemption that is redemption through Christ and number three, the forgiveness of sins, that is forgiveness because of Christ. Union with Christ, redemption through Christ, forgiveness because of Christ. What blessing, what thanksgiving ought we be giving to God for such great benefits that he gives us? First, union with Christ. And the text read, reads, in whom don't ever underestimate this tiny little preposition in because it speaks of priceless doctrine and is threaded right through the fabric of the new testament in fact it permeates every letter that we um to the point that we take it for granted we easily overlook this thing in whom and sometimes Somehow our brain looks at it and considers it as though it's like a, a full stop as the end of a paragraph or end of a sentence. And we just skip over it. Let's not do that. Uh, this phrase, by the way, is mentioned 184 times from, Revelation, from the book of Acts to Revelation. That is not including the Gospels. Sometimes it is rendered as in Jesus. Or in him, as we have in, in him. Or in Christ Jesus. Or in our Lord. Or in whom. They're all synonymous. Now, how important is this concept? There is a professor by the name of Edmund Clowney. He's a theologian. An ex-president. He passed away. An ex-president of Westminster Theological Seminary. He commented on this topic. And he says... Union with Christ 
is the central doctrine of how God dwells with us. Another theologian said, Union with Christ is the sum and substance of the Christian status, the definition of his relationship to Jesus. To be united with Jesus. That is to say, to be in him. That is to be connected. To be intimately identified with Jesus. It is, I believe, to be the best doctrine that we could possibly imagine that would bring us to see how close we really are to our Savior. You know, other religions, the closest thing that they can get to their God, perhaps, is to bow before Him. If they worship a tree, they would hug the tree, ride their God if it was a cow. But not us. Not us Christians. You know, Hare Krishnas are not in Krishna. Muslims are not in Allah. But praise be to our God. We, the sheep of his pastures, pasture, are in Christ. Our Savior is so personal that the scripture says in Colossians 3, 3, our life is hidden with Christ in God. And a verse later, it says, Christ is himself our life. And again, Galatians 2.20 says, Christ lives in us. Now, what does it really mean that we are in Christ? What does it mean? Well, the scripture gives us four metaphors to help our frail imagination to uh, come close to at least a glimpse of an idea of what it means to be in Christ. Let me, let me give you those four metaphors. The first one is in 1 Corinthians 3 where Jesus is the foundation and we are the building. And just like um, a building is secured and built upon this strong, solid foundation for stability, so our souls are secured and built upon Jesus Christ, who is our rock of ages. The second metaphor in John 15, where Jesus is referred to as the vineyard and we are the branches and just like the branches are dependent on the vine and all for all nourishment all vitamins and minerals and even life itself and without this vital union to the vine what happens to the branches they are as good as rotten dead so also our intimate connection to Christ, we are sucking out of Him all that is life and strength and vitality. Jesus is our fountain of living waters, the bread of life. That's a second metaphor. The, the third metaphor in Ephesians 5, 4, where Jesus is the head and we are the body. And just like the head is biologically connected to and takes care of the body and gives the body clarity, direction, and sense of order, so also Christ, who is our head, we are in Him. He supernaturally cares for us. He is our way, truth, and life. He gives us vision and purpose and direction in life. He gives us to know what is right and to feel what is right. The, third, the fourth metaphor is in Ephesians 5, where Jesus is referred to as our bridegroom and we are his bride. And just like this sacred union between a man and a woman in their matrimony, and, and it renders the man as the husband and the woman to be the wife, such that both are deemed to be one flesh. 
in such a way that all that the husband possesses belongs to the wife, legally speaking, and vice versa, so also in our mysterious union with Christ. We become one soul with Him. And all that we are and all that we have, which pretty much nothing else but sin, illegally His, and all that is He is and He richly possesses are legally ours. To be in Christ, it means that He is responsible to protect us, to nourish us, to cherish us. Union with Christ. I would say it's God's super glue. Because it glues us to all doctrines. All the blessings and the promises of God. It is, it is the air that we breathe in all of God's benefits to us. That's why in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. But it doesn't stop there. Here is what we assume to be the full stop. In Christ. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ. There is no spiritual blessing in the whole universe that we could enjoy apart from our union with our glorious Christ. This is something very important to consider. Another thing to consider in this point, in our union with Christ, it is not like another step in the process of our salvation. What I mean is, it's not like once upon a time before eternity began or eternity passed, God elected us and then later on He regenerated us. And somewhere um, at one point we have become united with Christ and after that we were, I don't know, regenerated or converted. It's not like this. Why? Because our intimacy with Jesus is threaded right through all stages of salvation. Covering from eternity past all the way to eternity future. Let me give you some examples from the scripture to understand what I'm saying. In election, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. It says that just as the Father chose us in Him. That is in Christ before the foundation of the world. Notice it doesn't say he chose us to be in him. No, the father's choice is to rescue us from even before time began was never done apart from our union with Christ. Long before God said, let there be light. You and I, brother and sisters, we were united with Christ. And what about 2,000 years ago? When Jesus came, took on flesh, walked on earth, and then later on accomplished redemption. Were we, were we united with him at that time? Well, absolutely, in every meaning of the word and in every moment of his life. You and I were there when Jesus performed miracles. You and I were there when he was baptized by John the Baptist. We were there with him even at the point of the cross. Now think about it for a moment. How can a judge punish an innocent man for crimes that someone else committed and yet be called a just judge? It doesn't make sense. He... He can't. God judges each one according to his own crimes, not for the crimes of others. And so also it is true at the time with, when Jesus was crucified. God never judges somebody else for crimes 
that he has not committed. But because Jesus is mysteriously and intimately so united with us in such a way that we were considered one with him, that our crimes then were legally transferred to him. So our union to Christ is the means by which our sins have become his and his righteousness have become ours. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. And here is our full stop. In him must never be our full stop. We must understand it is always our union with Christ that legitimately transferred, imputed our sins to him. Again, Galatians 3.27 says, clothed in his righteousness. Because we are one with Christ, all of our sins we can say, legitimately been transferred to him, imputed to him. And not only that, but also the scripture says that our old self was crucified with him. That when Jesus died, guess what? We died in him. And when he rose, we rose in him. And when he ascended up on high and took his place at the right hand of, of God, we ascended in Him. We are seated with Him. Brothers, what a stunning truth. What a glorious benefit. Ponder upon this. That our punishment was His punishment. That our righteousness was actually His righteousness. And His glorification. And even our regeneration, sanctification, justification, even all the way to consummation, every aspect of our entirety of our salvation are all in Him. This, is, this bond between us and Christ is so strong that sometimes we overlook it, but pay attention to what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 35. He says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It's a rhetorical question. And guess what? Guess how he answers this question two verses later. This is how he answers this rhetorical question. Verse 38, for I am convinced that neither Death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a benefit that melts our hearts away that takes away any kind of concept of loneliness that we may ever feel brothers can we meditate on this for a moment let us reflect deeper into this because consider who we are that are united to Christ we who are wicked are forever united to the righteous one. We who are dead in sin, not only are we made alive in, by God and in God, but, but we are forever united to the one who is called Prince of Life. We who are defeated creatures, not only are we empowered, but we are forever united to our conqueror. We who are lost sheep, not only are we found, but we are forever gripped by the clutches of our good shepherd. We who are miserable and sad sinners, not only are we comforted by God, 
but forever are we united with the one who is the source of joy. Brothers, we must open our minds and hearts to this inconceivable reality that not, not, not even the most intelligent person in the world not even for eternity to come will we ever plunge the depth or exhaust this richness of this wonderful doctrine. Give thanks to God. Give thanks to God. One commentator says, the text doesn't say that we are near Christ, that we are before Christ or beneath Christ. No, we are in Christ. We'll move on to the second point. First one. In whom? This is our union with Christ. And here in the context of this passage. We are in him. When he accomplished redemption. We have redemption. The second point is redemption through Christ. So here is a second benefit that ought to fuel our hearts with thanksgiving to God. In whom we have redemption. What does this word mean? Redemption. Well, the Greek word, and please don't condemn me for mispronouncing it, literal. And it refers to purchasing by making a payment, a ransom. And there's another Greek word that is also translated to the word redemption. And is very close and connected to this. And it's the word exagoro or exagoraso. Which comes from the word agora. I don't know if you heard this word before. If you've ever been at La Trobe University. And in, right in the middle of, of the uni, there is um, a, a garden in a shape of a circle and surrounded by uh, many uh, shops. And that place is called Agora, if you've been there. Now, what does this word mean? Basically, it means marketplace. Marketplace. So, redemption is an, is an ancient commercial word. And if we stick all the pieces together... What redemption actually means is to purchase something out of a marketplace by paying a ransom price. That's what redemption means. In general. But more specifically, scripture, biblically speaking, what is it that is purchased out of the marketplace? In the Old Testament, mostly... It speaks of slavery. For example, in Leviticus 25, um, verse 47 and 48, it says, Now, if a countryman of yours becomes so poor with regard to him, to him as to sell himself to a stranger who is sojourning with you, so sells himself, meaning he's a slave, or to the descendants of a stranger's family, then he shall have redemption right after he has been sold one of his brothers may redeem him in other words if an israelite had become so poor to the point that he would sell himself as a slave then the law of god uh, has an arrangement for this in that his family can buy him out of slavery by paying a ransom price another example to explain what redemption means Perhaps the most famous story of redemption, we know it, it's regarding the Israelites. The Israelites, they were oppressed. They were uh, forced to work as slaves to the Egyptians for 400 years. And God says in Exodus 6 verse 6, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out, of, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from the bondage, meaning slavery. I will also redeem you. God redeemed the Israelites by purchasing them out of slavery to the, to the Egyptians. And so in the same manner, 
our text says we have redemption. Or in the language of Paul in another passage in 1 Corinthians 6.20, it says, For you have been bought with a price. In other words, brothers and sisters, we were the slaves. But we weren't slaves to the Egyptians, right? Who were we slaves to? Well, Romans 6 verse 6 tells us we were slaves of sin. Romans, sorry, John 8 verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is what? A slave of sin. So just like the Israelites were under such bondage, a yoke that was too heavy to bear, and they couldn't wiggle their way out of it, <clears throat> we also were born into slavery. Slavery of sin. Under such bondage. And our hearts were chained to our master so to, to obey its lustful desires. With one exception to that story of the Egyptians and, and the Israelites. Why? Because our master was so deceptive that even if we could, we would have never been able to or wanted to wiggle our way out of it. We loved our bondage. We licked our chains. We loved our lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. We were slaves to sin, and we boasted in belonging to our master. Right? No one twisted our arms and forced us to be dishonoring to our parents or to be prideful. No one put a gun on our heads and, and coerced us to indulge in our passions of the flesh. It was us. Our master was ruling from the headquarters of our heart. And if we would cut up this flesh of ours into thousands of pieces and examine each part, we would have discovered that every part would have stunk with sin and had this label, this stamp on it, and it read, slave of sin. This was our condition. But then, what happened? The text says, in whom we have redemption. So we were standing there, as it were, in a marketplace, with cuffs in our hands, shackles in our feet, and we were under a curse because we did not obey God's law. And it says, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. Then suddenly, our kinsman redeemer shows up. And here he comes, the champion of our faith. And as he stepped into the stage of the world that he created, Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He purchased us. He bought us out. And what was the ransom price for our redemption? Peter answers this question in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. In other words, we were so slaves to sin that not all the most precious metal in the world could ever buy us out of slavery. And verse 19, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. He took the very priceless blood of the Son of God to be shed as the ransom price in order to set us free. This blood is so precious, brothers and sisters, that in Hebrew 9, 12 says that through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained what? Eternal redemption. This blood is so efficacious that one sacrificial act, one death of the giver of life, and it was able to purchase eternal freedom for a whole host of believers. And so it says in John 8, 36, 
So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Brothers, you were slaves, and now you are free. And the ransom price to free you was the life of Christ. What better benefit do you want to thank God for than to know that it was the very blood of the God-man to free you from slavery? Unbeliever, friend, if you have not come to Christ, the gates are wide open. You are most welcome to come by faith, lay hold on Christ, and you would be counted as one of the redeemed. And do you know what the result of redemption is? The moment you believe, your handcuffs will be broken, your chains would fall off, and you would be free to cherish Christ forever. Romans 6 verse 18 says, And having been freed from sin, you became slaves. Of righteousness. And what is righteousness. But our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words. To the degree that you love sin. To the same degree and more. You are free to choose to love Christ. And to enjoy him forever. What a perfect redemption. That is suitable for every sinner. That will come to Christ. Let me give you another verse. That is so powerful. If we understand the depth of it. Romans 6, 14. This is the result of redemption. It says, For sin shall not be master over you. It is not a command. Sin shall not be master over you. The word of God says it. It is a statement, not a command. Believer, do you feel despaired because of a besetting sin taking hold of you? Do you easily listen to the devil's lie when he says to you, you have no power to break free from your sin? And then you give in so quickly to your temptation. Here your hope lies, believer. Redemption means the power of sin is shattered. Brothers, be greatly encouraged because Jesus purchased you from your slavery. Which means you can now say with all boldness, no to sexual temptation. No to love for money. No to anger and bitterness. No to laziness and fear. Sin shall not be master over you. Believer, you are free to follow Christ. With a clear conscience. And you can raise your hands. And sing aloud this wonderful song. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. Amazing love. How can it be thou my God should die for me? How can we not be so ever thankful for this? How can we not but raise a banner and write on it with, with big fonts? Thanks be to you, Lord, for such a, a great redemption. Even better, perfect redemption. Not only did Christ redeem us from the power of sin, but obviously from the penalty of sin, and that is precisely the context of this passage. It says again, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Which brings us to the third point, forgiveness because of Christ. Union with Christ, redemption through Christ, forgiveness because of Christ. We are to thank God for the forgiveness of sins. Again, let us reflect on this one. Which sins? Which sins did Christ forgive us? Colossians 2.13 says, Having forgiven us all our transgressions. Psalm 103 verse 3, Who pardons all 
your iniquities. All sins. Yes, we've said it before many times, but we cannot say it enough. Past, present, and future sins. How many times I said this, and yet when I speak to people one on one, sometimes people will come to me and say, Oh, I, I know that Jesus forgave my past sins, but what if I sin tomorrow? I might end up in hell. Brothers, He forgave all our sins. When did He do that? At the point when He accomplished redemption. Yes, it was applied when you came to saving faith, but it was actually accomplished. Sins were forgiven at the point when Jesus died for them. Past, present, future. Long before you were born. Which sins? The big, the bad, and the ugly. All have been redeemed. We must understand this powerful reality that when God forgives, He forgives with infinite might. Where is our heavy guilt that we were carrying upon our shoulders? As far as, as, far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. What bearing does sin play in our position before a holy God? Praise be to our God. They're all buried in the sin of forgetfulness. Micah 7.19, it says, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, he will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I did a bit of a research on the web and I found that the depth of the sea is 11 kilometers. 11 kilometers full of water. Back then at Micah's time in this ancient world, this means one thing. That once your sins are redeemed, they were forgiven. And what was forgiven is forgotten and is irretrievable. Just like at Micah's time, no one could dive into the depth of the sea and retrieve anything that was buried there. So also our sins are gone forever. No matter how much they, they are or how ugly they are. So what is the result of all of this? Romans 8 verse 1, it says, Therefore, that is the result. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Brothers, where is the fear of judgment? Gone. Where is the dreadfulness of hell that haunted us? Vanished. Where are the guilt, the wrath, and the judgment that were weighing heavy upon our heart? Jesus absorbed them all. And instead, He serves you, brothers, in that golden platter, freedom, peace, joy, and on top of all of these tens of thousands of other reasons why we've got to live a life of thanksgiving. From our union with Him. They're having redemption through Him. And forgiveness because of Him. What a glorious Savior we have. Has He left anything that He didn't bless us? That was flowing out of His loving heart? Every soul can sing aloud and say, Jesus is suitable to me in every imaginable way. So what is the application of this? I've got one application. One simple application. Let us meditate on these blessings. Fill your mind and heart with them. Speak of them to one another. And then go home. And squeeze all the holy oil that you can get out of these benefits. And then pour it upon your head. And then lit up yourself with a fire of thanksgiving to God. Live a life of gratitude. 
regardless what, what goes through your lives and the trials you go through, be grateful for these benefits are yours and yours to keep forever. Unbelievers, here I come and I plead before you this morning. As you heard this message, there is that such beautiful union with Christ that anyone in Him is protected. And Jesus would guarantee that He would be nourished. That having redemption in Christ means that you are free from the sin that you are chasing after that is actually destroying you. You love your sin, unbeliever. You love your sin and you know it. And you think that sin satisfies you and that's why you're a slave of sin. But let me tell you the difference between being a slave of sin and being a slave of Christ. Sin that deceives you and makes you think somehow that it will satisfy you. You go to it. You bow to it. You obey it, hoping that it will satisfy you. But then what happens? You come out of it feeling more empty than when you first embraced this sin and gave to it. And then this sin would say to you, oh no, now that you feel more empty, what you should do is chase after me double portion so that you would feel the emptiness that you first had as plus the emptiness that you now experience. And you continue pursuing this sinful lifestyle like a mirage. And you go from slavery to a deeper and more powerful gripping slavery that leads to nothing but depression. Their sorrows will multiply those who chase after other gods. The, the path of the wicked is hard. Christ, what does he do? He promises true delight, true pleasure, true satisfaction. And a believer would run after Christ. And you know what happens? Christ delivers what he promises. And a believer comes out of that experience in obeying Christ, in following Christ. And he finds nothing but joy and delight in him. And so what does he do? He goes for more. And as he goes for more, and as he continues to taste and see that the Lord is good and gives him more of his life, the Lord delivers as he promises, and he continues to deliver as he promises. So he goes for more and more and much more. And that's how we grow. Why would you cling to your sin when it is so deceiving? Where it will lead you to hell. Path of destruction. It's inevitable that it will lead to hell, unbeliever, if you continue in your pursuit of sin. I offer you Christ this morning. And I plead with you. Oh, how I urge you. Come to him and you would be counted as one of the redeemed. Throw away your sin. Throw away this old mask. Come to Christ. Let him be your Lord. Let him be your savior. And begin this life, this journey with him. Though trials will be in your life. Though there will be sorrows upon sorrows because of your pursuit of Christ, but deep internally within your soul, the devil can never touch. Sin can never rule over. Once you give your life to Christ, it is his forever. Come and enjoy this union with our great Savior. Let us pray. Lord, 
If when we were slaves of sin, you saved us by redeeming us, will you not now, when we are free, that you will continue to protect us? If we, when we were full of sin, your blood of your son, Jesus Christ, was the ransom price to free us. Were you now that we are forgiven? Would you condemn us? No, Lord. Your love for us compels you to keep us. Your, our union with your son, Jesus, compels you to protect us. And for this, we are so thankful to you, Father. We are so thankful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.